one big thing about the magnet lab also is that all of our stuff is not physics and it's not um, magnet research, um, learning about more magnets. Um, our number one topic or, or field actually is material science. So of all the things we do, materials, energy, engineering, material science is number one, then physics, engineering, we do chemistry, biology. We have had COVID-19 um, at the lab as far as experimental wise. Um, our geochemistry department, our microscopy, we have a number, and of course, Jen does research at the Magnet Lab in, in, in um, learning. So um, all types of research going on at the Magnet Lab. It's not just physics and it's not just magnets. Um, we are on social media. Uh, you guys can go check us out later on, uh, but we're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, um, LinkedIn, and for whatever reason, Pinterest too. I, I don't know why yet, but we, we are. Our department is the Center for Integrating Research and Learning, um, CERL for short. We're the educational component of the MAG Lab. Um, we have an RET program, which unfortunately we were not able to have this past summer, um, but we do K-12 education. Uh, I know Jason has been to the Magnet Lab several times for um, field trips, and um, I've actually been to his wife's class at her, her high school, um, Gabi. Um, we do professional development like we're doing right now. We do workshops and conferences, and you can follow Cyril on Facebook too. Um, we'll share that link later on. So quickly, um, let's go through a historical trip about magnets and magnetism. And we're gonna start with my favorite dude right here. Um, and this is Nikola Tesla, but I have also got the name Gauss up there. Um, Gauss is the unit of measurement for magnetic fields named for Carl Frederick Gauss, did a lot of research on magnets. Um, but at the Magnet Lab, we actually use Tesla to measure how strong our magnets are. And the reason are because our magnets are significantly stronger than what you've got at home on your refrigerator. We're measuring in the Tesla range, or at home you'd probably be in the milli Kelvin, uh, I'm sorry, milli Tesla range. Um, so it takes 10,000 Gauss to equal one Tesla. And I'm going to tell you now what a Tesla is. So here are some magnetic fields. So your average refrigerator magnets is about 0 0.03 millitesla. Um, Earth's magnetic field is 0 0.000045 Tesla. Um, you gotta remember Earth's magnetic field is extremely large. I mean, it does cover the entire planet. Um, and by spreading it out, you are actually weakening it. Um, a person has a magnetic field. I'm going to tell you right now, all living things have some magnetic field around them. Um, and you can see just how small a human's magnetic field is, three times 10 to the negative 13th Tesla. Junkyard magnets, if they used to pick up and move the cars from one place to another, that's about one Tesla. And if you've ever had an MRI in a hospital or in a facility, that's a two or three Tesla magnet. If you've had an open MRI, those are going to be a little bit weaker, one and a half to two Tesla. Uh, but a traditional closed MRI is two to three Tesla. So what do we have at the Magnet Lab? We've got 21 Tesla. That's for ion cyclotron resonance. That is a world record. We have our 900 megahertz nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR, which is slightly different than MRI. The science is the same. The technique is the same. Um, the machines are a little bit different. Um, it is 21 Tesla. It doesn't have the star because it was a world record when it was commissioned. That magnet is about 13 years old now, so it does not hold that record anymore. Um, Oxford University beat it, then I think Cambridge beat it, and then we beat it, so we still have that record, uh, just on a different magnet. Um, we have a number of resistive magnets, I think about eight of them that scientists can use, and those range between 20 to 40 Tesla. Um, the split cell magnet is one-of-a-kind magnets. It is essentially two large electromagnets, one on top of the other with a tiny little gap um, a few millimeters apart in the very center. And that gap is there so that we can shoot lasers into the magnetic field because somebody wanted lasers and the magnetic fields together and we did it. Um, so that's the only magnet of its kind in the world. It's 25 Tesla. Um, our water-cooled DC magnet, direct current magnet, 41 and a half Tesla. That is a world record. China is working on beating that record. And I know that because we stole the record from them after they stole it from us. So this is gonna be a back and forth thing going through history. And that's okay because every time we break that record, again, technology is advanced, so that's a good thing. Um, but we currently hold that record and have for the last 
three years now. Um, our hybrid magnet uses 33 megawatts of electricity. It is a hybrid because it is part resistive and part superconducting. 45 Tesla is the world's strongest continuous field magnet, um, non-destructive magnet. We can hold 45 Tesla for several hours and scientists can do research on that. But 33 megawatts gives us an electric bill that's a couple thousand dollars an hour to operate that magnet. So that magnet does get expensive. Um, the series connected hybrid is a new design. That magnet is also about three years old. It is also resistive and superconducting. Um, and that magnet can do NMR at 1.5 gigahertz. Um, now earlier here, actually let me move the mouse, up here it says 900 megahertz NMR. That was the record at the time when this magnet was designed. Going down here to 1.5 gigahertz, this is the record right now for NMR. To give you an idea of how strong these magnets are and how well they can image what, whatever it is that is put into them, um, a typical MRI is working at about 75 megahertz. So at 900 megahertz, this magnet is going down to about the protein level and it's actually imaging different proteins. At 1.5 gigahertz, we're practically almost to the atomic level. So that's how well that magnet can image. Um, it is a world record, only one of its kind right now. And you see this 100.7, this is a pulse magnet. It is not a continuous field, so it's gonna hold that 100 Tesla for a fraction of a second. Um, I believe about 26 milliseconds. So not a whole lot of time to work with that magnet. Um, but the good thing is that 45 minutes later, you get another 26 milliseconds of research time. So uh, it is extensively grueling to work on that magnet. Um, the other bad thing is that after several uses, that magnet tends to spontaneously deconstruct. In other words, explode. Um, is not a bad thing. The stress on that magnet is enormous, so it is designed to go for a certain number of, of uses before it explodes. Um, and because of that, no one is in the building when those magnets are actually operated. Um, it is dangerous, but we put safety first. Um, I like showing this off because this shows you just how good the Magnet Lab is at pushing magnet technology. So the Magnet Lab was funded at Florida State in 1990. Um, and you can see here, Grenoble Ma uh, Magnet Lab is the one in uh, France, Amsterdam, of course, in the, in, uh, uh, the Netherlands, MIT in Boston. Um, these were records at the time, and then the Magnet Lab was funded right here. And when the Magnet Lab was founded, you can see that all these records started going off the charts. And we have our current records here, and we're very good at what we do, so it's just cool to show off, hey, look how many world records we have. Um, and this is just some of them. All right, so when were magnets first discovered? Oh, actually, hold on, before I go on, are there any questions? Anybody's good? Yeah, doing All good. Right. All right, so when were magnets first discovered? The story goes that uh, thousands of years ago, there was a shepherd named Magnus who was tending to his flock and noticed that there were very small pebbles that were sticking to the end of his staff. And he would go home and he would experiment with these magic rocks and find out that they would attract to the metal things that he had in his house because he was using a lot of iron. Um, but they wouldn't attract to the stone or, or the cloth or the wood. Um, so this is, this is the story. Um, as his name was Magnus, he named the rocks Magnets. Um, probably not true. The truth is probably that they came from the Magnus region in um, Southeast Asia, I believe. Um, maybe it's in Eurasia. I'm not sure where the Magnus region is anymore, uh, but that's another possibility. Uh, what we do know is that in 1269, Petrus Peregrinus wrote a book or a chapter about magnets and explained how magnets operated and was able to do so without talking about occult properties, supernatural beings and ghosts. Um, so he was able to say, hey, I've worked on these things, I've researched these things, this is what they do. So this is our first scientific publication talking about magnets. 
in 1600, William Gilbert wrote the magnet. Uh, and this is probably not the original. As you see, it would cost two US dollars in 1600, so it's probably not right. Uh, but this is the first book that was a critical research using lodestone, which was brought over from China. Um, and again, dispelling the superstitions and the myth and outlining this is what magnets do, this is how they operate, and talking about um, the compasses. And this is a big step forward um, using the compasses. 1820, this is a big deal. This is our 200th anniversary of 1820. Um, and a couple of major things happened in 1820, starting with Hans Christian Orsted setting up an experiment in his classroom, his lecture hall, um, connected wires to a brand new invention called a battery. And as he was connecting the wire, um, the wire was knocked off of its stand or wherever it was, and it landed on top of the compass, and the compass deflected, and Orsted noticed. And he was like, that's, that's unusual, it shouldn't do that. So he disconnected the battery and the compass went back to normal. So by this serendipitous act that happened, Orsted discovered that everywhere that there was electricity, there was some magnetic field here. Truth be told, if Orsted did not make that discovery, it was going to be made soon because in the very same year, Andre Marie Ampere was working on the same idea and piggybacking on Orsted's discovery, was able to discover that moving electrical charges produces magnetic fields. Now, this is one step more than Orsted did, because Orsted just said electricity has magnetism around it. And Pierre discovered that the direction of the electricity allowed the direction of the field. So he had two setups next to each other. And when the currents were going in the same direction as you see over here, the wires attracted to each other and they kind of bowed into each other. And when the electricity was moving in opposite directions, they repelled and they pushed away from each other. So Ampere went one step further and said, okay, not only did Orsted discover that the electricity has magnetism around it, but that has a direction to it, depending on the direction of the current. This led directly to the discovery of electromagnets, which happened four years later. Um, William Sturgeon, a British scientist, took a curved iron rod, which is uh, this right here, wrapped some bare copper wire, and that's an important um, uh, word there, bare copper wire, wrapped it around the iron rod, made 18 turns around that piece of iron, connected it to electricity, and that iron rod only weighing seven ounces, picked up nine pounds of weight. So he created an electromagnet. As soon as the current was turned off, the magnet lost its strength and the nine pounds fell off. The problem with Sturgeon's electromagnet was the bare copper wire because in 1824, insulation had not been discovered yet. In 1827, we had insulation and an American scientist by the name of Joseph Henry was able to take a larger iron rod, wrap a copper wire that was insulated with silk around it and do, able to go over his original turns, thereby adding more electricity. You can see, and actually this is an actual picture of Henry's electromagnet. You can see just how much copper wire is wrapped in this. And he was able to do this and pick up a significant amount of mass using this electromagnet. So by having the insulated wire, Henry learned that the more wraps you add, the more magnetism you're adding to the system. 1831, Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday, way back in 1820, when he read about Ampere, when he read about Orsted, he realized that if electricity had magnetism around it, the opposite had to be true as well, the magnetism had to have electricity in some way, shape, or form. And he worked on this now, it's pretty much since 1820. This was his goal. Um, in 1831, he wrapped two sets of wires around an iron ring. So here's my iron ring. He wrapped one set of, of wires, connected it to a switch and a battery. And this is exactly the same battery too, actually. No. Um, he took the other circuit, wrapped it around the iron rod, and then wrapped the other side of it around the compass. And when he closed the switch and the current started the flow, the compass deflected and slowly came back to normal. 
and this confounded him because he expected it to stay deflected. So he turned off the switch and when he did, it deflected in the opposite direction and slowly came back to normal again. And now we have the discovery of something called magnetic flux, the change of the magnetic field, either the introduction, the uh, removal, or the moving of that magnetic field. So now we've got magnetic flux and Faraday figured out that the introduction of flux was enough to magnetize the ring, create current in the opposite coil um, over here, which was enough to deflect the compass just for that second and then move it back to normal. So the flux created or induced the electricity that created the deflection in the compass. Um, at this point, Faraday realized that the coil is the important shape here for electromagnetism. 1831, Emil Lenz, Turkish scientist, um, Lenz's Law. Uh, I know Jason does this in his classroom. If you don't have a Lenz's Law set up in your classroom, you need to go get one. You can go by Home Depot and do it for under 10 bucks. Um, get a good copper pipe and a good neodymium magnet. And make sure that the neodymium magnet fits snugly inside the pipe, but it does go through. Um, what happens here is the magnet falls through the copper pipe. And as the magnet is falling through the copper pipe, gravity is pulling the magnet down. So the magnet is moving and the magnet's field is moving. So you have flux because the magnet is moving. And as the field is moving, it is making the electrons in the copper move. It is inducing a current in the copper. And because the electrons in the copper are moving and you have a current, they have a magnetic field too, just slightly. And the magnetic field that gets created here, this green one, this um, secondary magnetic field, repels the original magnetic field that comes from the magnet that is falling through the pipe. And if you do this properly, the magnet will fall through the copper pipe in slow motion. Because it is falling, gravity is pulling it down, but the magnetism that is being induced and created is repelling it and pushing it back up. So everything works against it and it goes down slower. In fact, if you try to push the magnet down harder, you will induce more current and you're going to actually push it back more. So by pushing it down harder, you don't make it go any faster. This is useful because roller coasters are starting to use Lenz's law for their brakes because as it is now, brakes wear out. If you put a piece of copper at the bottom of the roller coaster and two strong magnets on the bottom of the track, when that copper pipe goes into, those strong, that, into that strong magnetic field, Lenz's Law is gonna take over and it's going to slow down the entire roller coaster. The best thing about this is that cold, hot, wet, dry, frozen, it doesn't matter, this is going to work. So this is something that the weather is not going to interfere with as opposed to wet breaks, which we all know is a bad thing. In 1900, we got our free electron theory. And this is where we get really advanced. Um, the free electron theory talks about electrons moving through a wire. And instead of having a wire and electron or an electron flowing through this wire and going from one end to the other end, it's talking about the free electrons essentially bumping into each other and the electrons don't really move through. It's like a wave. And as you see a wave go across the surface of the pool, the water's not actually moving, but you see the wave moving. Well, that's how we're thinking about electrons. Instead of having the electron flowing through the entire circuit, the electrons are pushing other electrons. So you have that motion without the electrons actually moving from their position. Why is that important? Superconductor. Um, mistakenly discovered, but oh, so cool. And as soon as we figure this out, the world is going to change dramatically. Um, when I told you that material science is the number one thing that we research at the Magnet Lab, superconductors is the number one material that we are researching. Um, if we can figure these out, and we have a number of scientists trying to figure this out, and engineers, we can figure this out, we're going to drastically change the world for the better. So, you know that if you've um, had your kids build circuits in the classroom, eventually that wire starts to get hot. 
uh, that's because of the resistance. As the electrons are being, uh, are shaking or moving through that wire, there's resistance. They are doing work, and as they do work to move through that wire, they give off heat. Um, superconductors, when they are reached to a certain temperature, they lose their resistance, and not gradually like this. They completely drop off. Scientists do not like this straight line, by the way. Um, this little corner here, where it takes that gentle slope and just drops off, drives them crazy. And I know Jen studies um, data. I, I can, can't imagine that if she saw data that did that, she'd have a nervous breakdown. Um, and that's what happened with these scientists that were discovering superconductors. They changed their equipment numerous times. They redesigned their experiment numerous times because they refused to believe that this was a, oops, oh, wait, no, no, don't look at that. Um, they refused to believe that this was a natural occurring event here, this quick drop off. They thought that the machine was breaking, the experiment was failing at that point repeatedly. Um, so there was an issue with that, but we're able to overcome this and realize that it's actually the material and this is how it behaves. The resistance disappears and the electrons are able to move freely without friction and uh, because of that they can move incredibly fast giving a rise to new materials it, it just changes the whole ball game um, three scientists Bardeen, Cooper, Schrieffer, um, Schrieffer of which used to work at the magnet lab um, came, came by to explain how at certain temperature the protons don't have the energy to Oh, I'm sorry, not the protons. The nucleus of the atom doesn't have the energy to get in the way and attract to the electrons and create those collisions that create heat. They don't have enough energy or enough speed to get in the way, so the electrons can move without running into the protons or the nucleus. They're able to move freely, and then the weirdest thing happens. When one electron starts going, a second electron gets in the wake of that first electrons, and they kind of slipstream, they kind of draft like NASCAR um, race cars do. And by doing this, you're essentially doubling the electrical output without adding more energy into the system. So this is superconductivity and it only happens at extremely low temperatures. And that's our problem with it right now. Um, we have been able to increase the temperature from about negative 372 degrees um, Celsius to about negative 200 degrees Celsius. So we're still a long ways off, um, but we're still at extremely low temperatures. All right. Before I go on to explain how magnets work, are there any questions now? We got two more topics that we're going to cover. Uh, I thought I heard research of about of a, a really high temperature superconductor. I don't know where it was coming out of, but like something that was working at um, liquid nitrogen temperature. Is that not true? No, that is true. Um, the problem with um, high temperature superconductors, and I'm going to use air quotes on that. Um, the problem with high, high, super, high temperature superconductors is that they're still not efficient as the traditional superconductors. So we do have these materials. Um, and I know, Jason, when you bring your class out, I bring out the liquid nitrogen and we can see that happening. Um, it works great for demonstrating um, the Meissner effects and quantum pinning. However, it does not work for the actual transmission of um, um, electricity as well as the traditional electromagnets do. Um, I'm sorry, traditional superconductors do. So there's still a gap in that technology that we're trying to bridge. Okay, so there's like classes of superconductors, like efficiency classes or something? Yep, um, niobium tin is still one of the best superconductors that we have. Um, we also are using Rebco which is rare earth bismuth copper oxide. And we also have a material that they, um, they all talk about it like I know what they're talking about. It's called 2212. Um, and that's all I know. Um, it's a certain, 2212 refers to the ratio of isotopes in the material, but I don't know what those isotopes stand for. Same with Rebco. I don't know which rare earth they're using in that material. Um, but that's, that's where we're experimenting with new materials. Jason, I hope that helps. Yeah, I just, I just knew we had some. I knew I used some before that, yeah, they work. And I, 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 yeah, I didn't know the distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I will reach out to my um, buddy Ernesto Wolske, 
who is a uh, genius with all these things. Um, and I'll see if I can give you a better answer. And Jason, I can shoot you an email. Thank you. All right. Um, so magnets, big pictures time. All, right. all magnets have a North Pole and a South Pole. There are scientists looking for a magnetic monopole. Has it been discovered yet? Not really. <laughs> it's tough for me to say that because there are groups that say, yes, we found the magnetic monopole, um, but the research then gets torn apart when it gets to publication. So it's one of these things that people say that they've discovered it, but the research hasn't held up their end of it. Um, so we are constantly looking for a one-sided magnet, just the north or just the south. As of right now, all magnets have north and south. Secondary, all magnets have magnetic field. The magnetic field is a vector field. It moves from the north, I'm sorry, yeah, from the north to the south. So if my magnet is here, the field will be going up and around. And this picture here can illustrate how the field goes from the north to the south. And that's how attraction and repulsion happens. Because if you put two souths against each other, those vectors are pushing against each other, and so they're going to repel. And if you have a north and a south, those line up, so they're going to attract and come together. So it is the direction of the field that allows magnets to attract and repel. We always tell our kids, it's the pole that makes them attract and repel. Well, in a way, yes, it's the field coming out of the pole that truly makes it happen. Cool stuff, we can't see magnetic field, sucks for us. However, there are animals that can detect magnetism. Sea turtles are my absolute favorite. A female sea turtle can lay her eggs on a beach let's say St. George Island, right around the corner from Tallahassee. And when those turtles are born, they can go to the ocean, swim around the entire world, and return to St. George when it's time for her to lay her eggs again. Um, scientists say it's within 25 yards of where they were born. It's ridiculously accurate. Um, migratory birds, homing pigeons also do the same. Um, and a lot of sharks do it too. Some sharks do it for migratory purposes. Some do it for hunting. The hammerhead shark does not need to see its prey in order to bite. Um, I mentioned earlier that all living things have a magnetic field, and that is true. And every time that you move a muscle, you're sending an electrical signal from your brain to that muscle, and the muscle moves because of electronic stimuli, well, that's giving off magnetism. So if you stay very still and the shark swims around you, as soon as you move, it's gonna detect that motion of magnetic field and strike. So hammerheads don't need to see you to bite you, scary thing. Um, animals can see magnetism. Sharks aren't one of those, thankfully. Um, robins, just the regular good old fashioned robins that we have all over North Florida, they can see magnetism. Why? We don't know. How? We do know. We're able to dissect them and find the answer. Um, orangutans have shown that they can see magnetism, so the data says. And a lot of the wolves, foxes, coyotes, and dogs can actually um, see magnetism. Um, I know the Arctic fox has been proven to see magnetism. If you ever see video, and I got put the video in this presentation. If you ever see the video of the Arctic fox hunting and they do this little pounce thing um, in the snow, the direction they pounce from matters. And before they pounce, they align themselves to the magnetic field. And if they're able to align themselves in the direction that they want, their success rate is like 85 to 90% on their hunts. But if they are not able to align themselves that way, that hunt percentage drops to the 15 and 10%. So there is a huge difference for the Arctic fox on how it hunts, and it's all based off of the magnetism. Three materials are naturally magnetic at room temperature. Iron, nickel, cobalt. If you have a piece of iron or nickel or cobalt and you put a magnet up to it in your living room or in your kitchen, they're going to attract. If you have gadolinium or dysprosium and they are sitting in liquid nitrogen and you put a magnet up to them, at that point they will attract. If you have ruthenium and can force it into a cubic configuration instead of its hexagonal configuration um, or vice versa, I forget which way it goes, um, it will be naturally magnetic as well. The more we're testing things, the more the, we realize that different things on a periodic table become magnetic if we manipulate them one way or the other. Um, and there are a number of materials like neodymium and other rare earth metals that are strongly magnetic when mixed with iron. 
So neodymium by itself is not going to be magnetic, but when you mix it with iron, it becomes very strongly magnetic. Uh, if you have any magnetite or lodestone in your classroom, for the most part, you can tell your kids that they are the same. Truthfully, um, magnetite and lodestone are slightly different depending on where they come from. So the U.S. deposits of magnetite in New York are slightly different than the magnetite deposits that are in China, which are slightly different than the ones in Europe. So they are different. It's an iron configuration difference, but essentially they're all very similar. Um, they're all iron oxides in one shape or another. Permanent magnets are so-called because they almost always keep their field. So if you take that magnet off your fridge, it's going to be a magnet even if you hit it with a hammer. The only way to demagnetize them is to heat it to the Curie point at which it'll be so hot it'll lose its magnetism. And if you continue to heat it, it'll get to the melting point. If you electrify it, you can degauss the magnet and make it lose its magnetic field. Or if you hit it enough, I always joke that uh, magnets in kindergarten classes never work because they are held by kindergartners and dropped by kindergartners. Um, that is true. The, the more the kids hit the magnets, the weaker they're going to be. The good thing is you can take a magnet that has lost its magnetism, put it up to a stronger magnet and remagnetize it. Temporary magnets are things like paper clips or nails or screws or bolts. Um, these are things that are not magnets on their own. However, if you put it up to a permanent magnet, you can temporarily magnetize it and it will be a magnet for some time. Depending on how you magnetize it, what you magnetize it with, what material it's made out of, and how carefully you treat it, you can magnetize a paper clip or a pair of paper clips, have them together, attracting to each other, and if you're very careful with them, you can keep them hanging on the corner of your board for months, possibly even years. And all of this is because of the atom, all right? You got the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus. I don't care about those. It's all about the electrons, all right? Motion of charged particles create magnetic fields. Electrons are able to move. Therefore, electrons create magnetic fields. Most of the time, 99% of the time, um, atom, uh, the electron spins cancel each other out. We have this wonderful thing called the second law of thermodynamics in which the more energy you put into a system, the more disorganized it's going to be. The more sugar you give your children, the messier their rooms are going to be. The more you drop that Lego box, the more messier that Lego thing is going to be. Um, so the more you handle a piece of metal, the more disorganized its electrons are going to be. So this configuration here is normal. The electrons should be random and canceling each other out with their spins. However, when you have a magnetic field, it starts to pull those electrons into line. And when those electrons line up, you have created a magnet. This is how I, when you drop a paper clip after it's been magnetized, it loses its field. The impact on the table disrupts those, those um, organization. The electrons become random and you have no magnetism anymore. So to magnetize anything, paper clips, for example, all you gotta do is put a magnet on top of it. It is pulling those electrons into line and you have a magnet. This pen, even though it's plastic, if I could make the electrons in this pen line up, it would be a magnet until the electrons were to disorganize. Why is this important? Because electricity is the flow of electrons through that wire. We talked about this earlier. And when they do this, they tend to line up in the same direction, direct current, DC electricity. All those electrons are going in the same direction. So because those electrons are lined up, a magnetic field is created around it. So everywhere you have electricity, like Orsted said, you're going to have a magnetic field around it. We call motion of the electricity. Um, here's that coil again that we talked about with Orsted and with um, uh, Faraday. That coil is taking one strong field and starting to wrap it up into a coil and concentrating that magnetic field inside of that coil. So that's what this bottom picture is showing. One wire, one field. 
start wrapping up that field, you're concentrating that uh, magnetic field inside of that coil. This is how we make our electromagnets. This is how we make all of the MagLab's magnets. This is how we make our MRIs. Is that the next slide? It's not the next slide. This is how we make our MRIs. If you've ever been inside an MRI, there's a reason it's a tube. That tube is a completely round electromagnet you're being put inside in this little blue section here where the magnetic fields all concentrate, you're in the strongest part of the field. Um, how are you doing with questions? Everybody good? Uh, there was a question just in the chat. It says, does it matter how many times you wrap the coil? It does to a certain point. So um, the more coils you add, the stronger, the more magnetic fields you're adding, the stronger it's going to be. However, there becomes a point where you're either going too far away from the original field or you're wrapping over the original wrap. And again, you're getting too far where it doesn't contribute to the original field in the very center. So yes, there's a magic number to how far down you can wrap it and how far out you can wrap it. So good question. There's a lot of math involved in answering that question better, but I don't know the math, so. Um, at the Magnet Lab, we actually have very few magnets that are wrapped with wires. What we did is essentially took this coil here, cut all the way along here so that we have these discs, and we took those, stamped them down, and created these plates. And these plates are what carry the electricity for us. So you see that there's a separation here in this plate, and every one of these plates has a separation on it. I can't find it on the very small one, but I promise you it has a separation. I think it's right here. Um, and the big one, the separation's in the back, so you can't see it. So they all have that separation because this will connect to the plate above it, and this will connect to the plate below it. So we're creating the same spiral, but instead of making it out of a wire, we're making it out of these plates. So you've got this big, long DNA type thing, like a big um, a potato spiral, but it's made out of plates instead of these discs uh, or instead of this wire. Um, the reason we do this is because we're concentrating more magnetism in a smaller space and that gives us more magnetism. The holes that you see here, oh wait, no. The holes that you see here are actually there to allow the heat to escape because these are DC magnets. So there's heat coming through this. Um, these are copper plates. There's some silver mixed into them. Um, but the heat has to go somewhere. So when these magnets are operating, ice cold deionized water, no ions in that water, go through those holes to carry off that heat. And that deionized water, and it's important that it's deionized because these plates are still carrying electricity. So we gotta make sure that the heat's being carried off without short circuiting the entire system. All right, was there one more question I saw pop up? No? All right, here's some fun things you can do in your classroom. This is why you came to this talk, here we go. Um, so I'm hoping, I'm assuming that a lot of you do electromagnets in your classroom. If you don't, have your students make electromagnets. Um, you take, take an iron rod. Uh, if you don't have an iron rod, you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's, buy some iron bolts. I know a lot of teachers use nails. I don't like nails because of the sharp point. So I will buy bolts instead, and that way it's got a, a, um, a flat point and then the um, bigger end also. You can wrap a wire around it. You can use any copper wire. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, and you don't have to use a D battery. You can use a AA battery. You can use C batteries. You can use whatever batteries you have. Um, and you make your electromagnet. When I'm working with kids and they make an electromagnet, it never looks this neat. It's always disaster. It's a mess. It looks like, I'm just gonna make it look faster. It looks like this, and it's just a mess of wire wrapped around a, a bolt, and that's fine. Um, because they'll say, that looks good. How can you make it stronger? Does the neatness count? And of course the neatness counts. So they'll go back and they'll wrap it nicer, and it'll get stronger. Then I'll say, what else can you do to make it stronger? Leave it open-ended. Well, what if we have another battery? Great, here's another battery, go. Well, if we had more wire? Great, here's more wire, go. Somebody's gonna say, can I do two rods? Yeah, sure, have another bolt, go. Um, give them their options. I am mean, so I will give them an aluminum rod and say, here, use this instead. It doesn't work. Um, let, me, let me go back a step. I'm not that mean. 
I don't give them the aluminum rod and expect them to make an electromagnet out of it. I will give them a choice of metal rods, iron or aluminum, and have them choose. Um, and a lot of them like the bright, shiny aluminum. So then we, when it doesn't work, I'll go over and say, why don't you think it works? If your kids are super smart and they want a good challenge, start giving them more variables. I talked about the neatness and how the um, wrapping style matters. The number of turns or the number of winds that you put on the iron matter. The type of wire, if you have a thinner gauge, thinner wire will actually make a stronger magnet because you're putting those coils closer together. An older battery will not be as good as a new battery, so battery strength is a factor. The temperature matters. If you can freeze the iron, I'm sorry, freeze the wire before you give it to them, it will work better because it's got less resistance in it. And precision, this is my absolute favorite and the meanest one you can do. Um, tell your students to build an electromagnet that only picks up seven paper clips. Not at least seven, exactly seven. And the problem with this is if they've made their electromagnets before, they have a nice, fully, temporarily magnetized iron rod in front of them. And when they go and they start wrapping and removing uh, um, turns to make it weaker, they've forgotten that this has been magnetized and they've got to bang this or drop it or hit it on the floor or something to demagnetize this because they have slightly magnetized this and that residue, residual magnetic field matters. So just something to think about for problem solving if you're, if you're mean enough to give your kids this challenge and it's one of my favorite challenges. Um, I'll be honest, I learned it from a teacher at NSTA and I'm sharing it with you all now. It's my favorite thing to share. Um, the magnetic hedgehog, ferrofluids. If you can buy ferrofluids and lots of companies sell them now, I know Arbor Scientific does, um, Steve Spangler, Educational Innovations, they all sell ferrofluids. Um, if you can buy it, go ahead, buy a kit, show it off. If you buy the make at home version, beware. It is a mess to work with. It actually, when I work with raw fair fluids in my office, I will put on the lab coat, the gloves, and the face shield because it, it scares me. It can be, it can be slightly dangerous. So um, buy the pre-made sealed fair fluid. A lot of fun activities you can do with that. Um, I mentioned the induction by gravity, the lenses law dropping a magnet through a copper pipe and it will fall in slow motion. If you drop the magnet through a stainless steel pipe, which is a poor conductor, it'll fall normal. If you drop a stainless steel ball through the copper because it's not a magnet, it will fall normal. So you have to drop a magnet through copper to make this work. If you change up these variables, you will get different results. Not a magnet won't do anything, not copper will, depends on what you have. If you have um, iron, it's gonna attract and it's not gonna fall at all. If you have stainless steel, it's gonna fall through because it's a poor conductor. If you can afford to buy a silver pipe, what are you doing, teaching? You shouldn't be teaching. Um, no, but if you could buy a silver pipe, that's the best conductor and it's gonna fall the slow west. Um, if you could buy a gold pipe, that would be the absolute best, but we can't do that. Second induction by gravity part two, magnet again, PVC pipe or, or stainless steel pipe, and then an LED connected to probably about 100, 150 turns of wire. When the magnet falls through this, it's going to induce a current and the LED is going to turn on. Be careful when you do this that you are buying a two direction LED. Because if you buy a one direction LED and you drop the magnet through the wrong way, you'll have to flip the pipe over, which is not the end of the world, to flip the pipe over and drop it the other way. So it'll only work one way with a traditional LED. So if you buy a two direction LED, um, it'll actually turn red light one direction. If you flip the pipe over, it'll give you green light the other way. It's pretty cool. You can make a speaker. This is one of my favorite activities to do. Um, you have to sacrifice a set of headphones and get the 3.5 millimeter jack here. Um, you cut the other end of it. And when you cut the wire, 
there's going to be two wires inside here, a red one, a white one, or a red one and a black one, or a black and a white one, but two different wires inside here. Um, there could be a third. You can ignore the third. You want the two colored ones. Connect those two to copper wire, thin copper wire. Make it into a coil. Put that, co that coil up against the side of a cardboard tube. Put a magnet in the middle of that coil. And when you plug in that 3.5 millimeter jack, that um, cardboard tube is going to vibrate and you're going to have sound. So you've made a speaker. Um, when you look at these, that's exactly what's inside this. If you ever dissect one of these and you look inside it, there's a coil of wire, there's a magnet inside there. That magnet is suspended on a thin piece of plastic and it vibrates and that's how that works. So that's what's going on here, exactly what you see on the screen right there. I have the lesson plan for this AC-DC device. It is a little bit tricky, but again, it is a very cool demo to do. It shows that the electricity that you're getting from the wall is um, alternating current electricity. So you're gonna need a um, nine volt AC transformer, and you're going to cut that and put a female end of the plug, take the male end of the plug and connect this to the two um, wires here. You need a half watt, four to 500 ohm resistor. And yes, this is accurate. This is what it should look like. And then connect that to your bi-direction LED, your two direction LED. When you build this and you plug this into the wall, because the current is alternating back and forth, this LED is going to flash back and forth, red and green at 60 Hertz, 60 times a second. If you spin it around, you're going to get red and green circles going around you as you're spinning it because of the, um, the 60 Hertz frequency of the LED. Um, if you want this lesson plan and I have it, I actually have it right next to me. Um, email me, I'll take a picture and I'll send it to you because it's an awesome activity, but it gets tricky. Same with this. This activity is so confusing to me that we put it on the website and I'm going to direct you to the website to read it. Um, plotting electric field lines. We actually made a YouTube video that shows you this lesson and how to do this lesson because it is very cool, but it is very complicated to do as well. Now, um, on our website, we have electric motors, we have ion motors, making microphones, which is the reverse of doing the speaker. Um, you can build a Gauss meter. Two of my middle school students are building a Gauss meter with their mentors right now, um, all the way down to the circuitry and the breadboard. They're doing everything, it's kind of cool. Um, all these activities are on our website or I have. So if you can't find it on our website, email me and I'll be glad to get it to you. Um, if you want to know more about electricity and magnetism, a couple of books. Bill Robertson from NSTA, the Stop Faking It series, fantastic. This book is awesome. It is simple to read. Um, it avoids a lot of the complicated explanations. So um, a go-to guide for electricity and magnetism here. Driving Force by James Livingston, I will always include into my presentations because when I got hired at the Magnet Lab, my boss literally locked me in my office with this book and told me, read this when you're done, you can come work for us. That was my introduction to the Mag Lab. Um, Bill Bryson, Short History of Nearly Everything, has a chapter on electricity and magnetism, also one on paleontology that's very interesting. Um, I just love that book. It's a fascinating book. The Nature of Science by James Treffel is a mini encyclopedia for theories, principles, and laws in science. Um, this book is not huge, but it is so thorough that Murphy's Law is included with a proper explanation and definition. So love the nature of science. Um, and the Cold Wars, the history of superconductivity. If you want to really, really, really show off, you can read it in the original French. Um, you can get the translated version, which is easier. Uh, but if you want to read it in the French, you can. Um, our website, nationalmaglab.org backslash education will take you here. You can click on for teachers, for students, you can go to Magnet Academy where we have lesson plans and activities written down for you, ready to print, ready to go. Um, we have a lot of cool stuff on our website. And if you heard about this through a different website, Jen, I'm gonna turn it back over to you because the Virtual Science Collaborative is very new. 
Um, Jen, don't be confused. This is my view when I log into it. So yes, I did put the transformer thing on there because that's just me. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you so you can talk about this page. Uh, so the Virtual Science Collaborative is a site that we created um, through the Science Ed Department at FSU. And it was um, in response to calls that we got from teachers about this um, crazy, confusing time and ways to support them. Uh, and the idea and some of the early um, sort of uh, questions and suggestions we got was that we have uh, presentations or workshops like today that are um, content based, that are um, lessons that are that we can um, work through or even that uh, that can provide some um, insight into use about the technology tools that you can use like when you're in zoom or breakout rooms or other sort of platforms and we also you can see in here we have the curricular corner and so the goal is to have um, lessons that are biology chemistry sort of all of the science across middle and high school that um, help that are that are um, useful in both blended and online and in-person classrooms because that seems to be where there's the most sort of um, you know struggle right now is getting those you know you might have some students online and some students in the classroom so how do you really engage those all of those students actively and then we have videos and other resources so this video if Carlos is okay with it, we'll go on in that area. Um, and we have some other videos that are, people have made or are making about how to really um, use technology or if it's content area, sort of those sorts of things. Um, and then and on this link, you'll see that we also have some connections to other workshops. Carlos is doing two more workshops um, in the next month or two, and we have some other coming up. So uh, it would be great if you guys could uh, share this with your colleagues, because the goal is that it's a collaborative. Uh, and so we all come together and sort of share ideas and are learning and, and supporting each other. That's my pitch for it. You had some questions in the... Um, the chat box. Yeah, I had to unmute myself. Um, so if you want to reach out to me, this is my email address via at magnet.fsu.edu. I don't know why I still have my phone number there because I'm not in the office. So um, email me, please email me. I'm going to stop share now. Um, and I saw some questions coming into the chat and I will be glad to answer this. So what are the limitations to get obtain high magnetic fields? Okay. Um, Fascinating question. Um, I did a summer exploration series with um, scientists from around the lab. So this summer I invited the scientists to come on camera with me. We had a Zoom session and I invited middle and high school students from around the country to join us. And they asked, how come you can't go higher? How come you can't put more? Um, if we took our magnet and we put more electricity into our magnets as they are right now, they will overheat. We won't be able to cool them enough and they will melt. So the issue is the resistance on our traditional DC magnets. With the superconducting magnets, the issue is um, current load. The wires can only carry so much electricity, um, even at superconducting um, technologies, they can only carry a certain amount of current in the size of that wire. So there are issues with the um, amperage in the superconducting magnets and the temperature of the superconducting magnets. Um, there are magnets that have gone beyond 100 Tesla. There are magnets that are in the, um, I wanna say seven to 800 range. The problem with those, I'm ready for this, um, to maximize the magnetic field, they take the electromagnet and it's gonna be a pulse magnet. So they're gonna pulse all the electricity into it all at once. Then they're going to surround the magnet with dynamite and everything's going to blow at the same time. And the shock wave from the dynamite is actually going to help concentrate the magnetic field in the very center of that. So you can get a much stronger magnetic field, but there's nothing left. And that's how we get to beyond 100 Tesla magnets. They are destructive magnets or single turn magnets. Um, and that you get one turn and that's it. That magnet doesn't exist anymore. So um, the Japanese or a Japanese laboratory owns the record for the strongest magnet ever created on earth, um, but it doesn't exist anymore. 
So that's a one-time magnetic field. It is a pulse magnetic field. It's not continuous. That being said, I need to correct something because I lied to you um, and I didn't mean to. Um, I told you 45 Tesla was the strongest magnetic field and that's not true anymore. Um, last year, we had a test magnet, a prototype that um, after the scientists were happy with the results, they told the students, push the magnet until it fails. And that magnet was able to hold a 45.5 Tesla field before it failed. So 45.5 is the strongest magnetic field for a magnet, for a continuous field magnet. Um, however, the magnet did fail at 45.5. And after that, it was dissected to see what went wrong, what went right. So the magnet no longer exists. So our magnet is still the current strongest continuous field magnet because by default, the other one doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it is possible to go beyond that. We know that now and we are planning for new magnets. Hey, I have a question. I know there's a question in the chat also that's before me. Um, maybe they're related questions. Um, so I'm teaching the FLVS course for the first time um, because I was told I had to use Canvas and I had to use this course. And uh, I, have, I have some problems with just the methodology of the course, number one. And then we've been doing the motion module. There seems to be a lot of incorrect content in there. And I just worry about thousands of teachers all over Florida teaching this incorrect content. Is there a resource or somebody I could direct um, or get someone to change this, I guess, or? I would hope so. Um, and you know what, that doesn't shock me because I was in a classroom in Georgia uh, a few years ago teaching ele elementary kids. They're like third or fourth grade. Uh, and I told them that iron, nickel, and cobalt are the three magnets that are magnetic. And all the hands went up. I was like, uh-oh, what I say? Um, and in their textbook, it said iron, nickel, and steel. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not accurate. Um, they also showed me a section in their textbook that talked about the magnet lab. And I can tell you it was not written by someone at the magnet lab because that was a disaster as well. Um, Jason, let's... Um, Let's work on that. If you want to get with me and we can see what that looks like, um, I'd love to help you get that fixed. Um, I'm not familiar with the with that curriculum, but I'd love to take a look at it. Um, that being said, I am, and I keep saying this, I'm this close to offering virtual outreach for our classes, um, and this will be nationwide, of course. Um, so I'm this close to offering um, visits like me coming in and talking to kids about electromagnets and, and going through a presentation similar to this at the high school, middle school level. Um, it'll be the similar request form that we have on our website. Um, and it's this close to being finished. Uh, we're, we're fine tuning the pre and post materials, um, but it should be up soon. So hopefully I'll be able to come into the classrooms and assist. Did I miss anything? Um, I think Jennifer still has a question that I, I, I talked over. It's asking what strategies can help students in these blended classrooms. Like, I'm definitely like teaching this at mm. like the, the labs in there I, are not exciting for me or my students. Um, I was thinking of like that Sims maybe, but I don't know. Like, are there strategies that, and I know that some, and I like what you've presented today is over my head. I'm more biology in my background, but I know that some of the biology teachers talk about if they have students working with materials at home, it's really hard because they have to keep such a close eye on them that they can't do both in classroom. And so there's so many things going on. So I, are there uh, strategies that any of you guys have that you could share? I, I don't understand why they're forcing so many teachers to do the blended classrooms because I just don't see them working. And from every story I've heard, it's not working from the teacher's point of view. Um, that being said, I don't have the answer to that. FET simulations are great. Um, they're a lot of fun. Um, but even then, those, and, and in my wife's case, she, can, she can't use a FET simulation because her home students have the computer in front of them. The classroom teachers don't have, or the classroom students don't have technology in front of them. So there's a disconnect between the, what the students in the classroom have and what the students at home have. Um, I really wish they would allow them to go, hey, distance learners are doing this, home uh, or in brick and mortar students are doing this, um, but I'm not in charge, so nobody cares what I say. Um, 
I, I don't have an answer for that. That's a tough question and it's something I'm gonna look for and hopefully maybe I can post on the, um, on the website. Jason, you mentioned, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but did you have some, or anyone else, did you have some things that are working for you that you wanted to uh, think, share? Um, I, to, put you, to put you on the spot, or anyone on no, the spot? No, um, I, 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 I mean, I love FET. FET is definitely the best online single resource spot for doing things. Um, the, my, like all the things uh, Carlos talked about today, like building electromagnets and having kids experiment, and I mean, Lacking that this year is uh, the most difficult thing. Trying to just talk about these things conceptually, doing anything inquiry-based is like impossible unless you're on FET. Mm -hmm. um, and I just we, put the link, if anyone's unfamiliar with FET, I just put the link to FET on the um, chat so you can go check that out. It's a free resource. It's a fantastic resource. It's one of my favorite go-tos. Um, yeah, the, the only thing we've done so far is build a Rube Goldberg machine. Um, and like my kids in class could do that. My kids at home could do that. Cause you know, it was just grab any materials you had and that kind of fit with a motion module. Um, Jason, were you, were you able to send materials home or are the kids working with whatever they can find? I packed up 83 bags worth of materials and 10 were picked up. Oh, so, uh, I, yeah. it was, I, I spent all of my teacher lead money to, to make these kits and whatever and hours of time and people, yeah. So I'm, I'm a little frustrated with all of that, as everyone I'm sure else is. Um, yeah, I, I can promise you that that is a universal thing, um, the frustration level and the, you have no control over getting those materials to the students. Yeah. And, and, and <clears throat> that's why during the summer when I was, um, I was designing activities that for the students to do at home, and I was like, okay, I can't mark students off because they don't have something in their homes. If they don't, if they have an apartment and they don't have a garage for them to go and steal some wire from, I can't tell them, well, no, your, your, your project's not good enough. Um, so I, I made an electromagnet using um, a, a safety pin and some aluminum foil. Okay. It works. I mean, it didn't work very well, but it worked enough to so okay, it's an electromagnet. It's going to do something, but um, even then, I mean, yeah. It, it's, 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 I'll make the speakers. We certainly have enough toilet paper rolls at home after this. <laughs> Definitely. And I'll tell you what, from, uh, and I took that, that speaker activity from the summer camps and it has been highly popular in the summer camps. I remember, I remember um, it. That's why I remember seeing it. it. It's one of the highest rated activities from our summer camps. So if you can do that, it's just so cool and it works and you can plug it into your um, iPod you can listen to your music on the speaker that you created, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, but for the, you need to you need to sacrifice one of these, um, even if it's just a dollar store brand. You do need one of these. So, um, all right, everybody else feel good. Yeah, Jennifer, I, I really don't know answer to your question though. Like, how do you get actually students to engage in the care? It's this, it's so much harder through a through this through this interface. Um, it's. It is difficult. Well, if you guys happen to find anything, like we're trying to share those resources online because it is so difficult and hard to like manage this and who, you know, hopefully it will end soon enough, but you know, likely it will. will still and our website does have a few interactive um, Java um, applets that you can do and you can simulate. Um, but again, it's just, it's not a, it's not a very good replacement for the actual hands-on um, so, so this is a good conversation for us to bring to the website and, and start discussing because I don't have a, I don't have a good answer and hopefully we can find one, but I don't have a good answer. I was thinking, I don't mean to, I don't mean to drag this on, but I was thinking like when you were talking uh, early on about the information you gave us at the very start. And again, I'm like, this is not my field, so I don't know a lot about it, but I was trying to think of how could you show students, even at home, like these vast quantities that you're talking about, you know, mm. like what are, are there ways, are there videos, are there something like to really get that across? Cause you know, maybe students have been in MRIs or maybe they can't, but even for me, I'm like trying to like think of it. I know those things are vast. But it's and our website, our website's pretty good because we do have a series of videos called See Through Science that will take apart a Van de Graaff generator and show you how it works on the inside. It'll take apart one of our magnets and show you how it works on the inside. It'll take apart the MRI and show you how it's working and what it does. Um, the 
bad part about all this striking us is that it really exposed, and I'll be bluntly honest, um, our our virtual tour videos are dated and we need to update them. And that is where we need to improve. Um, that being said, a lot of our, um, even our YouTube website, if you go to the Mag Labs YouTube website, there's a lot of really good stuff, including interviews with scientists. Um, but we do have some good what's going on on the inside demos. Um, so there, there are good resources on our website that I can say I'm proud of and that um, either I helped to develop or were developed with me at the lab. So there's some good stuff. Oh, well, maybe I'll add those to the website. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have oh, to dig those out and, and, and send them to you, so. Thanks for, for doing this, this has been great. <laughs> yeah, um, and, I, and again, we've got a couple more coming on. Nature of Science next week is gonna be, um, I can next share week. My, let me share my screen. We have a couple. Um... And Jason, thanks for sharing that spreadsheet. We'll go check that out. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about that spreadsheet. So I'm also in a CorkNet group. It's a high yes. group. That's really awesome. If anybody's interested, we're always looking for more people to join. Uh, we have a workshop every summer. And this is a document that I've made over the past 10 years of doing that group and just collaborating in workshops. Um, so yeah, if you want, anyone wants, but it's all, most of it's all physics based. So if you're looking for any content in that area, there's lots of YouTube videos and simulations and. Ooh, Jason, I've got a presentation. Jen, when is the step up presentation? Did we bump that to January? No, wait, um, let me share my screen real quick. Uh -huh. uh, I've got a presentation for a step up um, workshop. I think um, Jason in particular, you're gonna love. There it is, January 12th. January 12th, yeah. Okay. We have some more techie stuff, and then we have lots of we have a few mm -hmm. nature of science because that was what um, Leon was was calling for because uh, that's sort of early in the year stuff. And we have culturally responsive, and then we have the step up workshop. Ooh, who's doing the culturally responsive pedagogy? Um, um, Clausel, do you know Clausel? Oh, I love Clausel. Clausel's doing it. Um, Jason, can I can I use some of your um, links here and add those yes. to the site? Okay. Steal okay. anything you want. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, we are 14 minutes past time, um, which I'm okay because I have nothing else to do right now. So, um, but I'm sure everybody else has to go make dinner, hang out, see their kids, plan for school. Unfortunately, I know that's near the top of the list for everybody. So thank you for joining us. I, I do appreciate the audience. Um, if you have any other questions, I'll stick around a little bit more, but if everybody is done, we'll call it a day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Bye.